Welcome to this conference. I'm very happy to see that you have turned up again in large numbers today uh, for uh, today's webinar of the Belgian Financial Forum, which with a special focus on financial stability issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's true to say that the coronavirus crisis reminded us of the unexpected shocks that can occur in societies, in economies and financial systems, although some can rightly claim to have warned us in advance. Anyway, this crisis not only laid to waste previous expectations and plans, it also required immediate and sometimes forceful reaction in order to assess the implications and contain the potential negative spillovers. The start of the pandemic crisis in, in March 2020 definitely ranks among one of the most uh, far-reaching global and systemic events in history. It put the resilience of our societies, economies and financial systems to the test. It was also a test of the resilience and agility of all kinds of policymakers, including those in charge of ensuring that the financial system continues to fulfill its key functions under duress, which is another way of saying creating a stability in the financial system. Now, in contrast to the crisis of 2008-2009, the financial system is part of the solution this time rather than part of the problem and this is in no small part due to the fact that financial institutions and policymakers learned some hard lessons from the global financial crisis and used the previous 10 years to put the financial system on more solid foundations now given the wide-ranging and multifaceted nature of these post-crisis reforms, I will not endeavour to use this short introduction to describe the basic features of the transformation of the financial system and of the way in which it is regulated and supervised. I only want to highlight one dimension, the one that pertains to the role of macroprudential policy in ensuring the financial stability. It is indeed only after the global financial crisis that macroprudential policy has gained the status that it has now as an indispensable and complementary pillar in the architecture to safeguard financial stability. Next, of course, to microprudential supervision, resolution and crisis management. In 2009, the European Commission tasked a high-level group to consider how financial supervision could be strengthened to better protect European citizens and rebuild trust in the financial system. And it advised that supervisory arrangements should concentrate not only on the supervision of individual firms, but also on the stability of the financial system as a whole. The group chaired by Mr. Jacques de la Rosière, recommended that a union level body be established with a mandate to oversee risk in the financial system. The European Systemic Risk Board, created by the regulation of December 16th in 2010, is the emanation of this important recommendation in the de la, de la Rosière report. The ESRB's mission is the macroprudential oversight of the EU financial system and the prevention and mitigation of systemic risks. Its remit is very broad, both in term, terms of financial institutions and markets to be covered. Uh, it includes banks, insurers, asset managers, so-called shadow banks or NBFIs, financial market infrastructures and other financial institutions and markets. Its horizon encompasses the EU member states, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. The ESRB's decision-making body, the General Board, is chaired by the President of the ECB, Christine Lagarde. Now, I'm very happy that uh, Francesco Mazzaferro, who has been the head of the Secretariat of the ESRB since its operational start in January 2011, has accepted our invitation to share with us his views on the financial stability perspective of the COVID pandemic, drawing on the many work streams and policy works that the ESRB has coordinated and overseen since the outbreak of the crisis. Mr. Mazzaferro, has been a key observer of the changes in the European financial landscape over the past 30 years, starting his international career in the Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission, where his work, where his work focused on the European Currency Unit and preparations for the introduction of the single currency. 
in 95 he joined the European Monetary Institute, which later became the European Central Bank, holding several distinguished positions before being appointed head of the European Systemic Risk Board, which was created in December 2010, as I said, just when Belgium ended her six months rotating EU presidency. And as a foreign minister of my country at that time, I very much remember these rather stressed times. But today we will be talking about yet another crisis. Thank you again, Francesco, for having accepted our invitation. We are now all ears. The floor is yours. So, thank you, Mr. Van Akere. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Governor. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak today at this webinar. I have also a personal connection to, to, to Belgium. Uh, I, I lived in Belgium, but even most importantly for me, if my wife, we married in Belgium, in, in the Grand Place. So everything which has to do with Belgium has a very nice remembering uh, for us. Now, um, I will speak a bit uh, about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, um, looking at the financial stability perspective, I will start with um, uh, some comments on what happened uh, uh, in March uh, 2020, but I would like also to comment on the most recent, uh, most recent developments, also raising some, some question marks on where we are, what we know, and what we don't, what we don't know. Of course, uh, as usual, I have to show this uh, disclaimer, uh, but let me immediately uh, go to the overview. As I was saying, the first part will be on the market turmoil of March 2020. It's a topic which is much discussed also because there is a lot of regulatory work which is going on in these days at the FSB, at IOSCO and so on to try to address uh, some of the vulnerabilities uh, which uh, emerged uh, uh, um, one, year, one year ago. I will try to explain also what has been the, so to speak, humble uh, and limited role which the SRB had uh, uh, in terms of trying to respond to, to the pandemic as we, uh, we have been using our tools, which are soft law tools, uh, to, to help authorities to, to, to find common ground and, uh, so to speak, also to, to, to try to inform each other uh, about what was uh, what's going on. Um, and, and then, of course, I will, uh, I will try to speak, as we're saying, about the changing landscape of finance, what is happening almost every day, every week uh, uh, to, to us, so new, new episodes of instability, new, new, new surprises, and try to uh, raise some, some conclusions or perhaps some, uh, some, question, uh, some questions, uh, question mark. Now, uh, first of all, uh, I will show you who are, of course, my, uh, my, my principals. I, I had a meeting with uh, two of them just, just this morning. Uh, Christine Lagarde is the chair uh, of, uh, uh, of the SRB uh, as president of the European Central Bank. Stefan Stefan Ingves, the governor of uh, uh, Riksbank, of uh, the bank uh, of, uh, of Central Bank of Sweden, is uh, the first vice chair. And we have also a second vice chair who is the chair of, uh, of uh, the EBA. As I was uh, uh, saying, uh, our tools are, uh, are soft law. Uh, there are warnings and recommendations which are subject to the act or explain principle. So basically, we cannot, so to speak, twist the arm of anybody, but we have to conquer, uh, conquer them uh, with, uh, with the strengths of our, of our arguments. Now, this this slide uh, is of course obviously very complex and to a certain extent even terrorizing. And uh, uh, why, why I'm showing why I'm showing uh, why I'm showing it because um, th this is a this is a slide which has been uh, used by the FSB uh, to try to explain uh, how complex and how interconnected uh, our uh, our our world uh, our world is. Um, I will return to it uh, later on to, to explain what has been our our responses uh, to the crisis. But basically, what you, you what you see is that the area of um, activity of the SRB, which is basically trying to uh, let's say cover all uh, all all the the say the those institutions between which are among the uh, ultimate borrowers on the left. Uh, and uh, the uh, the ultimate uh, 
uh, the, the, the Atomov lenders, uh, in, on the other hand, is of course uh, immensely, immensely, immensely com complex. Now, let's try to speak about what happened in March 2020. We had what is called the dash for uh, for for cash. The outbreak of the of the COVID pandemic led to an increase uh, in uh, interest risk uh, aversion. It was also obvious. Uh, people were seeing that there was a phenomenal collapse of, of GDP. Uh, this uh, uh, triggered a broad, uh, broad based uh, repricing of risk, like uh, every time there is a, a real shock. This is uh, illustrated uh, on the, the, the chart on the left hand side. The red line, which you see, uh, shows uh, options, uh, option implied volatility for the Euro stocks equity index. This is an indicator which is very often um, referred to in the market as the fear gauge. Uh, this uh, increase in, in risk aversion led to an increased demand for safe and liquid assets, now but notably cash. This, of course, created an imbalance in the demand and supply. Uh, and what happened, uh, for example, is uh, some segments of financial and non-financial corporate debt uh, markets became increasingly illiquid. Some of them also, uh, in case of, of uh, assets which are traditionally super, uh, super, super liquid. The dash for cash was accentuated by the a sharp uh, increase in payments uh, to be made and received for variation, variation margins on the derivative transaction. If you see again uh, the, the picture in, uh, on, on, the, on the left, uh, you will see the blue and the yellow lines, uh, which are exactly uh, the, the variation margins which are being made and received. And you see how large uh, the, the, the shock was. Now, if you turn on the right hand side, you see the initial margins, which are normally are more stable uh, by construction than the variation margins. After all, the variation margins are called like this because they have to variate. But also the initial margins increased sharply. Uh, there was there were ramifications to to other markets, and uh, so I, I was already showing how complex the financial sec sector is in its own ramification. Uh, for example, this chart, uh, which is uh, uh, also um, uh, I mean ta taken from uh, from the publication from the Financial Stability Review of the ECB, uh, shows redemptions by Dutch insurance corporations and uh, pension funds, uh, which of course, as you know, uh, in, in your neighboring country are very important. Uh, redemptions uh, from money market funds. Uh, so basically, um, the Dutch investors are a key player in the money market funds market, and they needed liquidity and they were selling uh, money market funds. The, the, the yellow line uh, is uh, is exactly is the the, the, the accumulation of net flows, uh, uh, um, and uh, they are highly correlated with the, the 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 incidence of net variation net variation uh, margins, which basically creates a connection between two markets, uh, which you would no, normally say uh, they are not highly correlated. So pensions, uh, insurance fund on the one hand, and the variation margins. Uh, which uh, are um, due uh, for uh, central counterparties for CCP. The combination of investor redemptions and deteriorating market liquidity of the assets held by investment funds uh, uh, created liquidity management challenges. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, not only hitting money market funds, so as I was showing here, in terms of uh, um, what happened with uh, with the Dutch investors, but also with corporate bond funds. Uh, with some of these uh, developments uh, reinforcing each other, and also in, an, in a situation in which, by the way, the public opinion and the markets were made extremely nervous by what was happening in terms of uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the new pandemic hitting uh, our society, there was a risk that impaired market functionings would adversely affect the ability of financial and non-financial uh, firms to raise funds. And this was at a, at a certain time, the moment for uh, central banks to, to, to enter uh, into, into, into action. And uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this chart uh, um, 
shows basically uh, indeed uh, what uh, what happened. Uh, central banks uh, in, worldwide, by the way, n not only not only in Europe, uh, with uh, with the ECB and the other central banks, uh, uh, the Bank of England, the various Rix banks, and the others. Uh, the central banks introduced extraordinary measures. Uh, this, uh, of course, included uh, asset purchase programs, uh, special liquidity operations, a U.S. dollar funding facilities uh, to restore market functioning, and maintain the efficient transmission of monetary policy measures. These interventions were effective, as you can see uh, from this chart, which shows that there is a world before and after uh, the interventions. Uh, this is also taken by a publication by the BIS Annual Economic Report. It, it plots uh, corporate bond spreads against the, the announcements of uh, some of these uh, interventions, including the ECB Pandemic uh, Emergency Purchase Program, uh, the PEP. In fact, uh, as you can also see in the title uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this slide, the Bank for International Settlements called, called this chapter uh, as uh, a monetary lifeline. Now, let me try to see at this stage what was uh, the uh, initial response of the ESRB uh, to, uh, to the pandemic. Um, it was articulate, articulated in, in, five, uh, in the five areas, um, on the, and the, I would like to comment briefly uh, on, on all of them. The first one was um, the need to establish a strong link between macroprudential authorities and uh, uh, governments, the financial, financial ministers. This was at the time in which governments started to take actions, to take measures. It was important to encourage uh, encourage them to do so. Uh, fiscal policy has been playing a, a great, a great importance in terms of, uh, let's say, stabilizing, uh, stabilizing the economy. It was also uh, important for us to get information uh, about those, uh, those measures, and uh, also to try to, to, to quantify them. By the way, the website of the SRB continues to. Uh, to publish on a regular basis a catalog of all the national measures which have been taken, uh, the moratoria, the, the, the public debt guarantees, uh, the, 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 tax, uh, the tax decisions and so on, uh, to offer to anybody who would like to be informed a, a global picture of, uh, of what has been, what has been happening. And in total, uh, the measures which have been taken by uh, European authorities are very important. They make almost seven percent of the GDP. Of the GDP. The, then uh, uh, we have been looking at the market illiquidity because, as I was saying, uh, market illiquidity was the first, uh, the third things, and in particular, we focused on the need uh, to ensure the liquidity uh, in uh, in uh, for investment funds. Uh, uh, for so uh, for asset managers and insurers, and in particular for those which had been uh, invested in in assets which were at risk from the point of view of like liquidity. So, in particular, um, real estate investment in real estate and investment uh, in uh, um, uh, in corporate bonds. And here, the cooperation with ESMA and the supervisors has been uh, very very important. Has been crucial. The dialogue between macro and, and, and micro has been extremely, uh, extremely, I think, useful and, and effective. Then we looked at uh, something, and this is the point number three, uh, which to a certain extent has not, has not materialized, uh, for God's sake. Uh, we were very, very worried of the fact that there might be well, the collapse of the corporate bond market in a situation in which there would be widespread uh, downgrades of, uh, of uh, corporates and uh, uh, situations even of possible defaults. Um, we, we, we knew that there was uh, a, a very large um, uh, set of assets which to a certain extent were discussed in the market as the possible fallen angels which were uh, short to becoming non-investment uh, non-investment bonds uh, if uh, uh, the the credit rating agency had been to drastically downgrade downgrade them so this has not materialized but also here we have been in dialogue also with the the the, the credit rating agencies and with all the national authorities to try to monitor and even to make an assessment of what could have been uh, the possible uh, the possible implications of uh, of a severe 
of uh, the severe deterioration of market conditions. The, the four things which we looked at was uh, to try to, 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 to reflect uh, on the need uh, to give uh, some clear signs uh, to banks, insurances, institutions, uh, even CCPs, uh, other investment uh, uh, firms, on the need to, to, um, to, to block the payment of, uh, of, of, of dividends and the other distributions, so the share paybacks and uh, the other payouts, uh, because of, of the need to preserve capital. So the risk would have been to distribute money uh, at the time in which uh, a, a, a few weeks after it might have been uh, this money would have, might have been very precious to to to, per, to make possible for banks to continue uh, to provide uh, um, a credit uh, credit to the, the economy. And finally, we looked at uh, the liquidity risks arising arising from from margin calls. As I told you, uh, we have been observing uh, with great uh, with great attention what was happening at margin calls in the derivative markets, in the centralized clearing uh, activity, and also the, the interaction between what was happening and the funding of these calls. So how these calls, margin calls, were, were funding, uh, funded. Who could have been having a problem of being short of having, so to speak, liquidity to pay, to pay the margins and finding himself over indebted uh, at, the same, at the same time. Now, all in all, I have to say that at least for now, uh, the measures uh, which uh, have been taken, but of course also the measures of many other authorities, I was referring to how important the role of fiscal policy has been, has been able to, to, stabilize, to stabilize the market. Now, looking at the, 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 the previous, uh, the, the pre uh, previous, uh, uh, the previous uh, picture, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, 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 I mean, what we have been doing, and you can start from the uh, left hand side. In June, uh, we have been issuing a recommendation on liquidity uh, arising from from margin calls. Uh, there, we have been working um, as over many years, in fact, uh, uh, on uh, CCPs and uh, uh, margins and haircuts uh, with uh, with a number of of uh, let's say. Of analytical and policy and policy products, and then turning to the right, uh, we have been issued recommendation and made the public statements on liquidity risks in investment funds. As I was saying, we have been even writing a letter to a Yopa concerning liquidity risks in the insurance sector, which uh, for years has been to a certain extent underestimated. Uh, and uh, and uh, also on these years, we on these topics in reality, we have been active for, for some years. Uh, to try to see what would be the need of macroprudential policy on insurance and investment funds. And I will finish my, my presentation exactly on, on this point, on the need to go beyond banking and try to understand how we can address vulnerabilities in the rest of the financial sector. Now, uh, putting all of these to together, much of the ESRB works, uh, uh, both on banks and non-banks, financial institutions, has focused on the resilience of the different sectors. Uh, for instance, for example, in the work on margin and haircuts on, on certain parts of the so-called piping uh, connecting these nodes. But the ESRB and the financial stability community more broadly still have some way to go and we will fully understand the implications of moving from a bank-based financial intermediation system, which is only one part of this, uh, of this uh, big, uh, big picture in front of you, to one that relies more heavily on market-based financial intermediation. Or, to put it differently, the changing nature on finance means that entity-based regulation uh, this we, we, which is the one which we have. We have a CRD for banks. We have Solvency II for insurance. Uh, uh, we, we have MIFID uh, for uh, some specific uh, specific markets and so on. Um, it may mean that entry entity based regulation may not suffice uh, when entities engage in a broad range of sometimes overlapping activities. And let, let me go now to, to the second part of, uh, of, of my presentation, which is exactly on the changing landscape of finance. And this changing land, uh, landscape of finance is something which is basically we are observing uh, day by day, hour by hour. 
uh, and uh, it is the product of technology, it's the product of a search for yield, of uh, also uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of course, of, uh, of people. And uh, to a certain extent, what we are now seeing is a number of episodes, and uh, I will excuse myself for you if I will now speak on only on things going wrong, but to a certain extent, uh, this is a bit in the nature of uh, of uh, of my job. Uh, we see a number of uh, of different uh, episodes, like they were snowflakes. You know, snowflakes are in reality uh, all different uh, uh, among uh, among uh, each other. No, and over the, the 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 past few years, we have seen a number of events, some of which very very surprising, that were all different. Uh, but at a certain time, they might have had uh, something in common. So let's briefly uh, re recap on uh, what uh, what have been uh, happening in this year. So early in 2021, uh, there was a GameStop. Uh, so GameStop was a US video game retailer, was the stock price rose sharply without any fundamental news about the firms. This was uh, causing large losses at uh, some US hedge funds uh, who had short position. Now, looking at what happened, this uh, sharp rise was related to a large number of investors, uh, to a large extent non-professional investors, uh, purchasing exposures to the companies and discussing their investment on social media. Investors also gained exposure by purchasing call options uh, on the stock. As the stock went up, uh, short sellers had to, to cover their positions, amplifying the price move. One US hedge funds faced very large losses, requiring a private uh, capital injection of uh, US, uh, 2 billion of US dollar. As trading activity and volatility jumped, the brokers had to, to post additional collateral to CCPs, also reflecting one-way trading dynamics. Some brokers said that to receive capital injections and impose temporary trading restrictions on the stock. So in non-technical it was uh, in non-technical terms, it was a real mess, which nobody could expect because it was the result of, uh, um, so to speak, uh, uh, small investors creating a coalition uh, using uh, uh, social social media and being able, so to speak, to beat uh, hedge funds uh, putting them on on their nose on their knees. This March, uh, there was a uh, uh, Archegos. I've never been clear whether what is really the the right pronunciation. I hear people saying Archegos, people say Archegos. So I will say Archegos Capital Management, a, a U.S. domiciled family office. Also something which you learn uh, when when crisis happens. And this Archegos was unable to meet variation margins costs on highly concentrated and leveraged positions on a few US and Chinese stocks. This led uh, to a large uh, to large losses at, at, at some uh, prime brokers uh, on their hedges. Now Archegos in reality had been able to obtain high exposures on the underlying stocks by using synthetic leverage and enter into similar swaps transactions with multiple brokers, each of which did not know about the others. So it was a situation in which Archegos was the mid, had taken a, an enormous bet. All the others have been providing liquidity to Archegos without knowing that Archegos was not only uh, exposed to them, but to other players. When the stock prices started to fall, variation margins call had to be met. The counterparties were forced to sell their hedges, which caused a sharp price fall, more than 50% for some stocks, and led to large losses from prime uh, brokers, including non US, US banks, in particular, as you may know from the press in Switzerland, uh, as these non US banks were perhaps slower to re reduce their positions. It's still, in, still in March, so we are things happening, so to speak, in a very short time. There was Grensil. Grensil was a UK firm specialized in supply chain finance, which filed for insolvency. Uh, there were ramifications for some banks, investment funds, and insurers. Now, uh, what Gr Gr Grensil was doing is was uh, to acquire trade receivable 
from suppliers at a discount, and then recoup the payment from the from the clients. Uh, those purchases were funded by a German bank, uh, the Kranzel Bank in uh, Bremen, uh, that belonged to the group, and uh, some of the receivables were repackaged into notes sold to investment funds with additional credit guarantee provided by insurers. So you see the entire set of the map of the financial sector there provided by insurers, by the way, notable insurance in, in Japan and in Australia to reduce uh, credit risk. In March, the bank supervisors froze the assets of the bank due to the suspicion of balance sheet manipulations, while in 2020, some insurers refused to, to renew uh, in, in Japan and, and Australia the, the guarantees of the bonds due to increased concerns about the ability of clients to pay the receivables. Such events led to substantial valuation issues which resulted in the, the suspension of redemption for eight EU funds. And then once again last year there was a wire card but we may probably have heard about it. There was a, a case of, an, uh, of accounting fraud uh, that result in the, the insolvency of the firm and losses for a number of banks. And then in 2019, we had uh, H2O and uh, Woodford uh, equity income funds. So these were investment funds which have invested in a liquid securities and needed to take measures when faced with large investor redemptions. While none of these idiosyncratic events in 2019 led to the materialization of a systemic risk, they occurred during stable market conditions and illustrate key vulnerabilities. Now, I spoke of snowflakes and you know, snowflakes can produce different, different outcomes. So on the left, you see a snowman and on the, on the right, you see an avalanche. So, snowflakes and we have to decide on wh whether in which scenario we are. Snowflakes can turn in different things and uh, we, we have to understand what may what to, might uh, might come uh, next. Um, and we have also to understand whether there are common themes about all these episodes. Now one thing which is uh, uh, in common to many of them, not all but many of them, uh, is that they are all trying to take excessive risk. Uh, certainly, it's probably not true for Wirecard uh, and where there was a, a real problem of criminality of GameStop or where there was a problem of people playing with, uh, uh, with the social media. But all the other cases, there was indeed an attempt uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, a, a, an attempt to search for yield, which to a certain extent is also something which is structured in a situation in which the low level of interest rates is predominating uh, everywhere in the world. But this is not the only, uh, the only story, is uh, why, why, why we didn't see these things happening, why many of these things were really a surprise uh, uh, for us. So what, what is the blind spot? And uh, uh, here, uh, what uh, what you see is that things are being uh, are being falling uh, between uh, the, the 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 regulatory the regulatory cracks, um, and I'm staying here in this uh, winter winter theme. So, as finance changes, uh, things become uh, blurrier, and uh, certain activities can be less neatly allocated, and the categories under uh, certain entities are vanishing. For example. As a technology company, Wirecard was not considered a bank, was not considered a financial institution, and for this reason was not uh, primarily supervised by a, a, a bank supervisor. And, uh, and, uh, and this, of course, uh, created the situation of a, of a big surprise. Uh, as a family office, uh, uh, Archegos uh, was uh, to considered as a, as, a, as a strange animal, if you want, but he would have probably not been considered if it had been in Europe as an alternative investment fund uh, management uh, manager. So he would have not been part of the EFMD. Um, li uh, likewise, on the contrary, an edge fund would be a, an EFMD. In other words, uh, much of our regulation uh, is, uh, is uh, still uh, um, it, it is still, alloca it's still allocating firms uh, in, uh, in boxes, uh, but uh, 
and and we have these entities entities based regulation but we have a number of cases and we have seen some of them uh, where we cannot allocate firms uh, uh, as neatly between entities for many reasons uh, new business models uh, new technology which makes possible uh, to, to, to provide services which in the past would have not been uh, provided. Uh, possibility to enter into a range of activities also due to technology, uh, which are to a certain extent worldwide, also for uh, companies which are not need to be, so to speak, uh, super large like it was happening in the past. In the past, uh, to be present uh, in uh, Australia, uh, Japan, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the entire world would have been required an organization and a size uh, which would have been much larger, larger than today. So I think what we have to, to learn from uh, what Daniel Tarullo was a, a previous member of the board of the governors uh, of the uh, Federal Reserve uh, has been telling us in a fascinating recent paper, which I would really uh, uh, recommend to uh, all of you, uh, uh, which is entitled, uh, entitled Congruent Financial Regulation. In, in it, he uh, argues, and I quote, that the regulatory structure is incomplete, and then incompleteness, that is the incongruence, leads to risk shifting and the creation of alternative pathways of financial intermediation that are neither planned nor have no optimum. End of the quote. Now, now, I now being uh, right now to to finish. If you want the the winter the the winter se the winter seasons of the slides, and as we are in a more summery picture, even if I have to tell you that in the last weeks, uh, I I think uh, I, I think in Frankfurt we are more in a monsonic uh, in a monsonic uh, season than in in spring. Uh, I would like to make a, a reference to the need for a regulatory duck test. No? Uh, maybe we are meaning, uh, missing regulatory mo uh, uh, modification of the. Uh, we, need, we, we need some. Uh, maybe we need some common sense uh, judgment. By this, I mean that even if uh, something uh, uh, looks like a duck, uh, swims like a duck, and quacks uh, quacks like a duck. Uh, we do not need, uh, necessarily need to conclude that it is a duck. Uh, we, we, and and we, we, uh, we, we have to reflect uh, on uh, uh, on how to treat uh, how to treat it. To use again the words of Daniel uh, Tarullo, and I'm quoting: "The regulation of economically similar activities would be coordinated across, uh, uh, across agencies, with the goals of minimizing regulatory arbitrage and ensuring that the social cost of systemic risks are internalized by private actors, regardless of their institutional form. To achieve this, it calls for the regulation to be congruent, not necessarily identical. And this is a very important distinction. Congruent uh, re regulation makes use of economically similar but not identical instruments with regulation coordinated across agencies. Now, uh, this has been an important part also of our mission. Uh, we have been publishing already in July 2016 a macroprudential policy um, uh, strategy on how to bring macroprudential policy beyond banking. Uh, this is an important, an important mission which remains uh, uh, with us. It's been a commitment of, of all uh, the chairs of the SRB, uh, of uh, uh, Trichet, Draghi and Madame Lagarde. And this puts us to a certain extent uh, completely in line with what uh, Tarullo has been uh, telling us. Now I've been speaking 40 minutes. I hope it was interesting and I'm of course uh, uh, ready and willing to, to take any comment uh, and uh, uh, on, on my presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mr. Mazafero, for your uh, very extensive 
overview of the activities and the concerns of the ESRB. Uh, the ESRB is perhaps not the most well-known institution, but it is certainly not the least important institution in our financial system. Indeed, uh, it was a pity that we could, for technical reasons, not show the feed with your image, Mr. Mazzaferro. I'm but, here now. Uh, but as we, uh, as we announced, there have been uh, posed, yes, about 10 uh, very relevant questions. And uh, I want to address uh, a few questions to you, if you agree. So, uh, perhaps a, a first question uh, about someone who is uh, very concerned about dividends. Uh, the ESRB has recommended restrictions on bank payings, paying dividends during the COVID crisis. Do you think that dividend restrictions are a useful tool beyond the COVID-19 crisis. Can this tool be improved or moderated? What is your opinion about that? So, uh, first of all, of course, you understand that I'm not able now to make any, any announcement of what we will go to do beyond the recommendation of the SRB, which expires in, in, in September. But I, I would like to say um, a couple of things uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in general terms. First, I think it has been pretty useful. If we are going to see what has been the uh, increase of uh, the capacity of the banking sector to, to lend uh, in, import, due in, in very difficult conditions, part of this has been due to the fact that the banking sector was able to conserve capital. And, uh, and the, the fact of giving a, a clear message, which has been given not only by the SRB, but has been given also by the EBA, by the SSM, by EIOPA, all of this has been protecting not only the banking sector, but also in insurance and other players from, uh, from, 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 from risks of, uh, so to speak, of finding themselves, as we're saying, without the munitions. That's, uh, now, one of the issues which we will have to discuss is um, the following. We have been activating recommendations. So we have been recommending other institutions which have been recommending and have been recommending and so on. Um, all of this uh, perhaps uh, needs some, some more direct, uh, direct uh, instruments. I, I don't think it should be the SRB to have direct instruments on, on, uh, on, um, uh, I mean, private companies, but this, the 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 microprudential supervisors should have more powers. Um, should have more powers in a situation in which, of course, they will have to be, um, so to speak, reliable, and there should be a clear uh, need to explain uh, to the political system. Uh, accountability is absolutely important, this type of things. But at the very end, they should have more tools in the future um, on the possibility to intervene on, uh, on dividends. Thank you. Uh, uh, a second question, uh, two times even. Does the ESRB uh, evaluate the risk associated with digital assets like bitcoins and ethereum and uh, other digital assets so the, the srb has not been specifically doing this work uh, because one of the fundamental uh, rule is that we we, sh we should to a certain extent also divide ourselves uh, the, the, the work among uh, different activities otherwise there is a huge overlap on who is doing what but this is of course a, 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 an area of uh, increasing concern and i would say the international level so the the fsb is extremely is extremely active on 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 these things and uh, it, it's clear that uh, uh, th this is becoming a, a word which is uh, very, very complex. It's very complex, um, not only because of the volatility, the instability of, of these assets, mm -hmm. but also because the interaction between uh, their nature as uh, um, IT 
completely based tools uh, and the risk which could come from cyber. Uh, um, we have now uh, in a world in which we are seeing things which uh, in the past would have been difficult to think. So we have a sort of coarser war uh, played by, so to speak, private, uh, private players. We have seen what has been happening recently with an attack of uh, a, a, a criminal group uh, on, on the continental pipeline in, uh, in the US. So imagine a, an attack of this nature on, on cyber assets and what would have been or what could be the loss of value for those who have been investing there. So thank you. Um, a question on the non-performing loans. So while the banks have not yet seen non-performing loans rise, thanks to the moratoria and the public support, how do you assess the risk of a serious increase in non-performing loans in the coming month when support measures will be dismantled? Well, first of all, we have to say that uh, we think that the banking sector is much, much stronger than, than it was uh, in the past. No? And, uh, uh, as Governor Fernacker has been referring to the fact that, that by learning the, 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 the tough story, banks have become much, much stronger. So from this point of view, we would not see in the current situation the risk of uh, a large systemic, uh, let's say, crisis coming from, from non-performing loans. Also because there has been a very strong, I mean, action taken by institutions and to, to try to prepare themselves. Nevertheless, it's very important that banks make their job well, that they, it's very important to provision. Uh, it's very important to provision, it's, to, it's very important to classify the loans uh, uh, accurately. Um, and then, of course, one has to continue to be vigilant because we don't see uh, NPLs, but of course we, we see that uh, there is an, incre an increase on, in uh, stage, two, uh, stage two credits, which basically means that something, of course, in the economy is going to happen. There have been losses. Uh, these losses now, I think, are probably very diverse from country to country also on the basis of uh, commercial specialization, economic specialization. Uh, we do not have uh, a, a general collapse of the uh, corporate sector, not at all. Uh, and, and so uh, it's very important from this point of view that uh, whoever banks remains uh, very, very vigilant on some segments of the economy. Yes, we received uh... A quite similar uh, question with a focus on the public debt. So the, the question is as follows. Public debt has increased a lot because of the COVID crisis. Debt levels are much higher now than in 2010. Do you think the COVID-19 crisis will trigger or risk to trigger a new public debt crisis as we, as we have seen in the past? I think a lot will depend on what will be the strengths of, uh, of the recovery. At the very end, uh, the debt which has been created has been created for different reasons than the past. And uh, now we have to see what will happen in terms of the recovery. And uh, if our countries will be able to, 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 let's say, to grow fast and faster than it has been in, in the past. So the very, very important is was referring to fiscal policy. It's very important that governments are activating policies which are facilitating growth. So if this happens, uh, and we, we, we hope that to a certain extent at least there is an attempt of, of doing this, uh, then it will be also easier uh, to reduce uh, the debt to GDP ratios. So thank you. Uh, uh a more, uh, perhaps more specialized question on the financial architecture, on the, the supervisory architecture. Uh, do you think, Mr. Masafero, that the coexistence of different supervisors within the financial supervisory architecture will enhance the risk of incongruence in the concrete application and the interpretation of the regulatory framework? Look, this is a never-ending story because 
normally these things changes only if there is a catastrophe, no? So regularly, so you start to, to say that if there is a catastrophe, then you make a twin peak. Then there is another catastrophe and you the difference and you make the, the single uh, the single supervisor. Then there is another catastrophe and uh, you divide them by three. So I hope that there will be no catastrophe and the situation will remain like it is. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a question referring to your uh, uh, conference. Uh, you mentioned the risk posed by the snowflakes within the financial system, but there are also tail risks coming from outside the financial system, such as the, pandem the pandemic. Does the ESRB monitor or tries to monitor such tail risks and how should yeah. they do it? Yeah, yeah, I think this is to a certain extent our uh, bread and butter. Uh, now, not from the point of view, if you want, of the virologists, because this we do not we do not have this competence. But if if you were, so to speak, in the mosquito in the room uh, of where where we work, you would discover that we speak only of things going catastrophically badly. There is no discussion on things going well because the discussion, if we discuss about things going well, means that we are not doing for what we are paid for. So, uh, yes, we are looking, uh, I mean, these hybrid risks, uh, uh, which are, I would say, technological risk, uh, geopolitical risk, climate change risks, and these type of things are becoming more and more important. And by the way, um, uh, they also require also a, a capacity of all of us to cross uh, among cultures, among disciplines, uh, uh, to, to, to try to understand new languages and, and try to understand what, what could go, what could be, the, so to speak, the vulnerabilities and the threats of the future. So, um, I have a few questions left and we have uh, indeed uh, about uh, five, maximum ten minutes. Uh, uh, a question about uh, asset bubbles. Uh, are you concerned in the post-COVID uh, period about the rebound of the economy creating asset bubbles? And where do you see a risk of asset bubbles? Well, we um, have been issuing uh, uh, um, recommendations on the real estate and we are continuing certainly to look at real estate. Now, uh, real estate, by the way, is very diverse, country by country. Real estate is also very different in what is residential and commercial. If you are speaking about the COVID, by the way, the impact on residential and commercial is being very different. Residential, what you have is a boom in, in pricing because now everybody would like to live in a castle, uh, having on the first floor the home office and the second floor the, let's say the, the the cinema, the private cinema, in which you will work, uh, in, in, in which you will work, so to speak, uh, uh, in the, during your, during the coffee break, and, uh, and on the roof, uh, the terrace uh, to 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 take uh, to take the sun. Uh, on the other hand, commercial real estate uh, is hit is it because of the the need of less space. I think. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what has been the the, the impact, but the announcement in Brussels. Uh, uh, that the European Co Commission is halving the number of buildings must have uh, a, a local impact on, on, on commercial real estate prices in, in, in Brussels, because of course the, com the Commission is a very large, is a, a local is a very large institution. So if all the institutions were now, imagine that all now all the, the, the federal, uh, um, uh, regional uh, and the community institutions in Belgium uh, they decided to have the use of, of of offices. Well, in a place like Brussels, it would mean that you have a very large number of, uh, so to speak, of uh, objects which uh, which are uh, uh, under discussion. And then, of course, there is also the impact for commercial real estate on the fact that uh, uh, people are getting uh, now packages uh, by Amazon and these type of things. And, and so the, the also the way in which you're approaching yourself to, to buying has been, has been changing. So this gives you only, in a, and it's not only this, it's much more than this, uh, but it is it, obvious that uh, in an age of changes, 
you you have always to reflect on the level of prices. Are they too high or too low? So thank you, uh, Mr. Mazzaferro. Uh, I have two questions to conclude. Uh, one concrete question about capital buffers and another about uh, a policy advice. The, the first question, uh, in the COVID crisis, supervisors have relaxed capital buffers to give banks room to, to provide credit to the real economy. Do we know or do we monitor whether this relaxation of buffers is working and has worked? No, it, look, this is a, is a topic on which a lot of work is being done, including, by the way, I know very well in Belgium because uh, your, your colleagues at our table are exactly explaining what, what, what they are doing. So there is a lot, uh, there is a lot of monitoring. There is also a lot of questions, Mark, which we have is whether the current framework uh, is, 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 uh, is completely, uh, so to speak, delivering uh, what we would like to have uh, or not. Having said that, uh, the, the issue is incredibly complex. So it is easy to start with the question the answer is of uh, such a degree of intricacy that uh, I would even not try to, 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 to answer here. So thank you, and uh, I want to conclude this uh, Q&A &E &E session with uh, the question of one million. Eh? Uh, what will be your uh, priority advices to, the, to Belgium in order to strengthen financial stability? Oh. Uh, this I don't know. Honestly, I, I I was not prepared for or I was not prepared for for this question. I think what I would say in general is what I would say to everybody. So uh, we have a very good framework for cooperation. It's very important that we use it as much as possible, and I think we are doing it. So as much as possible, uh, exchanging data, information, try to inform ourselves, uh, try to to learn from each other. <coughs> as I was saying. There are things which are happening almost every month which are taking us by surprise. And honestly, I think it will continue like this. Uh, so at the very end, it could be an immense collection of snowflakes, like it could be a, a bigger problem. And uh, the key, the key, the key issue is to 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 stay to stay in contact and uh, to have a very permanent and strong dialogue. So thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mazzaferro. Uh, dear speaker, uh, dear participants, with this last question, I want to conclude this very interesting webinar. Mr. Mazzaferro, we were very happy to have you uh, with us. Uh, the same for me. Thank you very for much your, for your uh, explanation, your extensive overviews, and your uh, very honest and very direct answers to our questions. Those questions were very, very interesting, which is showing, of course, the, the interest uh, for this kind of uh, webinars. To our public, thank you very much for your participation. we like to see you again uh, on uh, one of our uh, next uh, webinars. And as usual, you will get the invitation in your mailbox. Thank you very much, and, and I'd like to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Toxins. Au revoir. Thank you very much. Thank it was very insightful. Thank you. Bye-bye.